Good evening everybody, my name is Joe Henson and I'm a PhD student at the Leicester Loughborough Biomedical Research Unit based at the Leicester Diabetes Centre which we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a moment. First of all I want to say thank you very much for coming along this evening. Um, I know it's very sunny outside so I appreciate you giving up your time to come and listen today to the talk around sensory behaviour and health. A bit of a disclaimer from the start, as you can see I'm not Dr Charlotte Edwardson so I apologise in advance if any of you have come expecting to hear from her. Brief overview of the talk, as you can see, got the Leicester Diabetes Centre, which I'll go into a bit more detail. We'll then move on to the effects of central behaviour on health, and then finishing with the research that we've got ongoing at the moment. So if we move on then to look at the Leicester Diabetes Centre, so this is how it looked back in 2011. So as you can see, it's, it's derelict, and thankfully things have moved on slightly since then. It's actually four old hospital wards that have been converted into a bespoke research infrastructure. Um, it covers a wide range of areas, so we're able to do clinical studies, but also now we're able to do exercise studies as well. And this is a combination of work between the University of Leicester, the Leicester NHS Trust, and also the Biomedical Research Unit. So this is the very nice foyer area that we have now and also various pictures which we'll have a look at in a moment. But first of all, it's probably worth mentioning as well that we, our team is multidisciplinary, so it covers a wide range of people, which range from PhD students, healthcare assistants, nurses, doctors. And as I mentioned, it's housed within the Leicester General Hospital. And we also undertake research across all aspects that affect the prevention and management of chronic disease, in particular type 2 diabetes. And as I mentioned before, we do this through experimental investigations, but also in large randomised control trials. In terms of how much space it takes up, it's over 4,000 metres squared of dedicated research infrastructure. And as I said, as well, we're able to carry out clinical assessments, so we have various patient education facilities as well, state-of-the-art exercise and metabolic assessment labs. So we're really able to look at the effects across the whole movement continuum of too much sitting, but also high intensity exercise and the effect that this has on health, again in particular in type 2 diabetes. So this is the foyer area. And here we had our grand opening at the back end of last year and there's a little bit of a prize if anybody can spot the celebrity. Yep, it's Sir Steve Redgrave in the middle there who came to, to open the centre last year. And as I mentioned, we're extremely fortunate to have a wide range of exercise equipment that we're able to do a lot of our testing on. And also, we can see in this room, we also have a um, dedicated area to carry out our central behaviour research. So there's quite a nice, comfortable chair that's just hiding behind the door there. And that enables people to come in and, and sit down all day and we can essentially monitor their behaviour. Again, we've got other exercise equipment, so standard things that you'd see in a gym and a couple of extra things. Some of it looks like torture equipment, but I can assure you it's not. I'm just going to briefly talk about what type 2 diabetes is now, and I apologise in advance if this is a bit too simple, but I think it helps us to, to understand, so we're all talking from the same page. Essentially, it's complicated. This is just a few of the factors that affect type 2 diabetes. So over the next five minutes, I'm going to try and put it in a bit of a nutshell for you, although, as I say, it is, it's quite difficult. So we've all had tea and biscuits. So I'll just talk through what happens when you've had this in a normal person, someone that doesn't have type 2 diabetes. So what happens is the liver converts the simple sugar glucose into a long-chain molecule, molecule called glycogen. So glycogen is used because it's insoluble and it doesn't need much water to store it unlike glucose. Now we've all had the sensation where we perhaps feel a little bit lightheaded, perhaps we think oh I could just do with a bit of sugar. So the body responds to this when there's too little sugar in the blood by asking the pancreas to secrete the hormone glucagon. On the flip side when we have too much glucose which is a hallmark of type 2 diabetes we secrete insulin and try and store the glucose for later on in the liver and when the liver becomes full it's then stored as fat. So what's actually going wrong in somebody that has type 2 diabetes? So uh, as you probably know it's closely related to insulin and human insulin is a protein that's normally produced by the beta cells in the pancreas. 
the best way to think about it is insulin acting as a key really to unlock the cells so if there's not enough insulin or it's not working properly the cells can only be partially unlocked or not at all and glucose builds up in the blood and this is really what happens in people with type 2 diabetes it develops when the body can still make some insulin or these keys to allow the glucose into the cells but perhaps not enough or when the insulin that is produced doesn't work properly and this is known as insulin resistance so we need energy, we need to get the glucose into our cells, so we need to produce enough insulin. And so here's what's happening with insulin resistance. We can see here we have the insulin, and then when we eat some food, we need to get that glucose in for energy, as I say, and we need that insulin to open the cells. But over time, these become clogged up with fat, meaning that you can't get it into the system, and therefore you have more and more circulating glucose, which is then potentially picked up in a diabetes test and here we also have a picture of insulin resistance as I say this precedes type 2 diabetes so everybody will usually have in some sort of insulin resistance before they go on to develop type 2 diabetes I'm now going to just briefly touch upon some of the complications of type 2 diabetes but I won't stay on it for too long because I know it is quite depressing but it's just to give you a very brief overview. So one of the first complications is retinopathy. And retinopathy as you can imagine is damage to the retina which is the seeing part at the back of the eye and it's a complication that can affect anybody that has diabetes and it's actually the most common cause of blindness among people of working age in the UK. As retinopathy spreads, dark patches appear in the vision. And then over time, there's a, a blurring and a loss at the center of vision in what's called maculopathy. It's probably worth mentioning that all of the complications that I'll discuss now are, are actually treatable if caught early enough. The next one is the cardiovascular disease. So this is extremely prevalent in people with diabetes. And those with diabetes have a five-fold increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease compared to those without and the results of this are um, obviously an increased risk of cardiovascular events and it's caused by poorly controlled glucose levels which affect the lining of the body's arter arterial walls and it increases the likelihood of ferring up of the vessels which forms a narrowing or atherosclerosis and people with diabetes often have lower HDL levels which is a good cholesterol and lower levels of cholesterol. Diabetic nephropathy or diabetic kidney disease develops slowly over many years, but if caught early on, it can be treated. And again, it's linked to poorly controlled blood glucose levels and high blood pressure, and this causes damage to the tiny vessels that supply the kidneys. It causes them to thicken or become irregular, and therefore they're unable to filter waste products from the blood into the urine and preventing the kidneys from doing their job properly. Finally, neuropathy, again, is related to the the nerves. How diabetes causes nerves damage is not fully understood. However, high blood pressure, so high sugar levels, are known to harm the nerves' ability to transmit signals and damage the blood vessels that carry nutrients and oxygen to the nerves. So good diabetes control is obviously important. Moving on to the prevalence, as you can see, it's a huge problem worldwide. And actually, probably more importantly, if we look at the number in terms of those that are undiagnosed, it's about 46%. So there are a large proportion of people actually walking around with type 2 diabetes and they don't even know it. So that's why not only management of diabetes, but also prevention of diabetes is extremely important. Moving on more specifically to the UK, you can see that in 2010, the prevalence in most areas was under 7%, but if we skip forward 18 years, we can see the huge problem that we're going to encounter if prevalence rates continue. Most areas will then be at 10% and over. And in terms of how much this costs, it costs the NHS about 10 billion pounds a year to treat type two diabetes and its complications. That's about a million pounds an hour. And actually it's thought that every six seconds somebody dies from type two diabetes and its complications. 
So hopefully that's not depressed you all too much. Um, we're now going to move on to look at the purpose of this talk, which is around sentry behavior. So as you can see, sentry behavior comes from the Latin word sedere, meaning to sit, and it's best characterized um, as an energy expenditure of less than 1.5 METs. So METs is the energy cost of physical activity and is expressed as a multiple of the resting metabolic rate. So the resting metabolic rate for most people sat doing nothing will be one. So you can see that sentry behavior is not much above and beyond that. But given the fact it's impractical to measure energy expenditure in most studies, and there are limited behaviors that involve both sitting and an energy expenditure, it's best conceptualized as the amount of time people spend sitting. And it's often much easier to record in large numbers as well. Just want to give you a bit of an idea of the epidemiological thinking, so how it's moved through the decades. So sitting down is not new, people have done it for years. And really the first studies that connected a lack of physical activity with adverse health consequences were conducted by Jeremy Morris and colleagues in the 1950s. And they found high rates of cardiovascular events in sentry bus drivers versus more active bus conductors. There was then a shift in the 1980s and 1990s to the recommendations that we know today, so physical activity on at least five days a week for 30 minutes. There was then a revival in interest really in the effects of sentry behavior on health in the early 2000s. People have now become more and more interested to look at the independent effect of too much sitting on health, and so much so that it's now become a lot more prevalent. It's not only um, in the news, an awful lot is quite a topical subject, but there's, in terms of the published papers, they've increased rapidly. And also there's articles in magazines as well. And essentially over time, people have just become more and more sedentary. So much so that studies estimate that individuals spend between 50 and 80% of their day sat down. And we'll have a look in a moment at how easy it is to actually accumulate this sedentary time. So just want to uh, look at now in terms of um, putting together the century time until the start of the 20th century physical activity was an inevitable part of people's lives with almost all daily endeavors involving some sort of physical exertion and the constant pursuit of technological advancement and industrialization has shifted the balance to more and more century lifestyles i hope that photo isn't true and i hope that it's been photoshopped I just want to go through now a very quick example of the um, technologically advanced sitting orientated society that we have. So this describes a typical day for somebody, and not too dissimilar to myself. So wake up at seven o'clock, wolf breakfast down, and then sit in a nice long queue of traffic to try and get to work, which you then sit throughout the whole day, work through your lunch because you haven't done enough during the morning. Again, begin the travel home before the rush to get the evening meal ready. You then quite pleased with yourself because you've squeezed in 30 minutes of exercise before sitting in front of the TV, falling asleep, usually watching something quite dreadful. And actually when you add this up throughout the day, it equals more than 14 hours in sedentary pursuit. So you can see how easy it is. And in, let's imagine you're awake for 18 hours. That's quite a huge proportion of your day. So I just want to show you where it fits in the movement continuum and this really highlights the different focus of sedentary physiology and exercise physiology. So most of the research to date has been conducted at the exercise physiology end of the spectrum. But actually, although the benefits of moderate to vigorous physical activity are unequivocal and the current recommendations are based on sound science, there is accumulating evidence that just concentrating solely on how much physical activity somebody does may overlook an area that's of fundamental importance to metabolic health, which is sedentary behavior. And there's numerous epidemiological studies that have actually shown a dose response relationship between the amount of time people spend sitting and certain markers of metabolic health. And importantly, this is independent of the level of exercise and also independent of their body mass index as well. And we'll come on to look in a moment at the effects of simply getting up out of your chair, so breaks and light activity on health and whether it has an impact at all. So I won't ask you to, um, but 
broadly people fit into one of these four categories so obviously in the top left we've got the sedentary and inactive and then in the bottom right we've got the active and not sedentary so sedentary and active they don't do a lot but it is possible for actually activity and sedentary behavior to coexist as you can see there in the top right and until recently the health risks associated with the sedentary lifestyle were thought to be the result of insufficient activity leading actually many to conclude in error that sedentary behavior and lack of physical activity were the same construct but actually they act, exert their own independent influences on health so the tendency to treat them as the same construct actually contradicts the, the evidence. So an example would be an office worker who jogs or bikes to work for 30 minutes, but then sits at the rest of the day and spends uh, most of their evening watching television. In terms of the effects with health, you can see that high levels of sitting associated with type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, certain types of cancers and premature mortality. This is not an exclusive list, it, it goes on and on, this is just to, to highlight a few. And as I mentioned before, we'll look at the effect of breaking sedentary behaviour, so simply getting up out of your chair, and the effect that that has on markers such as glucose, insulin, and more traditional markers of adiposity, so waist circumference and body mass index as well. In terms of the research that we've done through the um, Leicester Loughborough Biomedical Research Unit, this was probably one of the main papers that we had published which looked at all of the studies that have ever examined sedentary time and put them all together. And this actually showed that when you looked at all of the studies, those that sat the most compared to those that sat the least had an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, as you'd expect, but it was actually 112% greater. And again, this is independent of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Moving on, we've also shown um, that sedentary behaviour is associated with the metabolic syndrome. This is where you get a clustering of unhealthy um, markers of health, such as waist circumference and high cholesterol level. And that was 73% more, more prevalent in those that sat for large proportions of time. We've also more recently shown um, we took a group of high-risk individuals and monitored their activity for seven days. And when we compared that to their markers of health, so their glucose and their um, fat levels, we actually found that it was the amount of time people spent sitting that had the biggest impact on health, not the levels of exercise that they did. And conversely, when we looked at the breaks in sedentary behaviour, simply got getting up out of their chair every so often resulted in a significantly reduced waist circumference and body mass index as well. And then finally, again more recently, we've shown the effects of sedentary behaviour may go beyond traditional markers of health that you would have done normally in a GP practice, and they may actually affect markers of inflammation as well. Um, again, this is independent of the levels of moderate to vigorous physical activity, so the negative effect may go beyond traditional measures. A little bit of new research that we've recently conducted was to look at the effects of sedentary time on markers of fat. So not only waist circumference and body mass index, but also the fat that we can't see, the fat that happens on the inside. And in order to measure this, we um, conducted MRI scans on a group of high-risk individuals. And what happened was essentially we photographed them from the neck down to the bottom of the, the bum and we got various slices that we then quantified the levels of fat with. So anything that glows up white is essentially fat on these images here. So first of all, once we'd isolated the slices, we wanted to work out how much heart fat they had. So it involved simply drawing a region around the heart there. And that gave us a number that correlated to their heart fat. Moving on, we then looked at the total body fat, which involved simply drawing around the, the edge of their body. So it incorporated all of the fat around the organs, as well as the fat in the, the liver and the heart. This just highlights visceral fat, so fat around the organs. And then more specifically, when we calculated liver fat, all we had to do was simply identify the liver and then drop 
a nice region of interest on there and it, it spat out a number so in terms of uh, ease of use that was probably the best one and we've actually found that sentry behaviours associated with not only heart fat but also visceral fat and liver fat as well and again this is independent of the levels of moderate to rigorous physical activity so these graphs simply show that those who sat the least compared to those that sat the most had lower levels of liver, heart and visceral fat so it may well be as well that sitting for too long actually drives the fat not only in where you can see it but also to places that it probably shouldn't go which is known as ectopic fat there is a little bit of positive news um, I did mention earlier so we're now going to look at this breaks in century time hypothesis so here we have two individuals um, We've both got exactly the same amount of sedentary time, so let's say they both sit for 10 hours a day. We've got one that would be classed as a prolonger, one as a breaker. You can see with the prolonger here we have big chunks of green, so that means that they've sat for, for large proportions of time, whereas we've got the breaker. It looks a little bit more like a barcode, so they're up and down quite a lot. And as I say, they've both got the same amount of sedentary time, but they've just accumulated it in, in different ways. And actually, the, the, the person that breaks their sedentary behaviour most often will have a significantly lower level in terms of waist circumference and body mass index. So this was one of the first trials really to, to show us that actually the, the, there is some benefit in simply getting up out of your chair. And it may well be not just driven solely by how much energy you expend. But again, we'll come on to look at this in a little bit more detail later on. I just wanted to, to show you this um, to highlight really the, the effects of energy expenditure for simply getting up out of your chair and in the interest of time I'll just go through two different scenarios. So here we have scenario three is a typical office worker who gets into work and sits for nearly 14 hours a day um, spends a bit of time pottering about but then squeezes in the 30 minutes of activity. Typically they'd expend about 2000 calories a day we then have scenario four, somebody that doesn't tick the box for exercise, so you'll notice they don't do any moderate intensity physical activity at all, but they spend the majority of time on their feet as their sedentary time is a lot less. And in terms of calories burned, for example, the waiter would burn a significantly more than this um, office worker, even though the office worker has been out and conducted um, their levels of exercise, so they, they would have ticked that box to say, yes, they do enough activity. So what's actually going on then? What's driving all of these observations? Why does sitting have such a profound effect upon health? Well, one of the, the pitfalls really is that uh, sedentary behavior research is still in its infancy. A lot of the research conducted, as I mentioned before, has just been epidemiological, so done in everyday life. Whereas actually th there's a real need for more intervention studies that look at the effect of too much sitting upon health. However, it has been hypothesized um, in studies conducted in animals that it may be a specific protein known as lipoprotein lipase that plays an important role in the effect of sedentary behavior on health. Um, lipoprotein lipase is known to affect um, your fat, so triglycerides and HDL cholesterol. So we'll just try and explain now what, what goes on. So this was actually done in animal models, so this was done in, in rats. So when they're allowed to wander around their cage as freely as they like, you can see here that what looked like cherries is actually the active lipoprotein lipase. And as you can see, it's essentially mopping up all of the spare yellow blobs. And what that means is that then there's not that much triglycerides floating around the system. Interestingly though, what happened when they had their little legs suspended was you notice when they went to be more physically inactive, there wasn't as much active lipoprotein lipase at all. You can see in terms of the, the red areas, there's a lot less from the reduced energy, energy demand. Therefore, it means that there's higher levels of circulating triglycerides, and therefore it increases people's risks of not only type 2 diabetes, but also cardiovascular disease. So it would appear that there's something, something going on uh, and we need to dig a little bit deeper. But what we already know from human intervention studies, 
So there has been studies, obviously conducted in humans, and one of the the major and one of the really landmark studies that's been conducted recently has been carried out by Professor Dunstan and colleagues in Australia. And what they did was they took um, a group of people and essentially manipulated their behaviour for the whole day. So individuals would come into their laboratory for seven hours and they would either go through a bout of uninterrupted sitting or they'd be allowed to, to sit, but then they'd break this with either light activity, so walking on a treadmill, or moderate activity, which would involve running. So as you can see, that at the top, they're in for seven hours, so they get for two hours, they just sit and do nothing, and they monitor their, their levels, and then they're given um, probably some sort of drink, and that's why you get the big spike in these insulin levels, because the body's essentially responding to this big sugar rush and says, right, I need to try and get this level down so it produces more insulin. And as you can see, the uninterrupted sitting has the highest area in terms of the curve. And essentially what you want to see is a lower area under the curve. The lower the area under the curve, the less insulin has been produced and the less hard your pancreas has to work. And as you can see, when you compare the sitting that's broken with light and moderate activity there's actually a 23 percent reduction in in insulin area under the curve compared to when people sat throughout the whole day again we see a very similar pattern with glucose you can see again after the the breakfast there's a big spike that then comes out down throughout the day and this actually caused a 24 percent reduction in the area under the curve but interestingly what you'll notice is actually there's no significant difference between the light activity and the moderate activity. They're, they're almost exactly the same. So that's really starting to tell us that simply getting up from your chair, standing and moving about could be as beneficial for, in terms of your glucose and insulin levels as going for a brisk walk. But what do we still need to know? So these research that's been conducted is great but we still need to dig a little bit deeper because we're not sure exactly what effect standing has on health we know that getting up and moving around might be beneficial but what about simply standing next to your chair and also how often do you need to get up and move about and at what intensity has also not really been in teased out in the research so that's where um this study comes in which is forming a major part of my PhD study which is actually looking at the effects of sitting, standing and walking on health and as you'd expect the primary objective is to really measure the area under the glucose curve in those with a high risk of developing type 2 diabetes and also we'll measure the fat levels and the insulin concentrations very similar to the David Dunstan study that we looked at before Essentially, there's three different treatment conditions, as I've said, sitting, standing, and light activity, and it's tested over two periods. It's best described here in this table. So let's say, for example, um, one of the ladies that comes in is randomized to condition C. The first time they'll come in, they will sit, but they'll break that with bouts of walking, and then the next time they come in, they'll sit. And um, so for some people, it can be quite a long day. The inclusion criteria at the moment it's only um, sedentary, overweight or obese postmenopausal females that are typically aged between 50 and 75 with some sort of screen detected impaired glucose tolerance. So a lot of these um, ladies have actually taken part in a research study recently. So that's where we're getting our patients from at the moment. But there is a plan to, to really broaden this and look at not only females but also males and also widen the age range as well. So I'll just go very briefly through the experimental conditions. So treatment condition A is where they sit and do nothing. So walking and standing really is restricted. It can be quite undignified actually because uh, we, almost, we always actually wheelchair people to the toilet which gets some funny looks. Um, so having fasted from 10 p.m. the night before, they have a cannula fitted in their arm. And then essentially they're asked just to carry out sentry pursuits. So read, um, watch movies, anything that they feel comfortable with. And what we do is we provide them with a meal which is tailored towards their body weight. Um, so we give them breakfast and lunch. So it's very specific in terms of the amounts of carbohydrates, fats and proteins. 
and as you can see here from the graph we've got the, the two meals here the breakfast and the lunch and then we've got 11 blood samples and blood pressure measurements across the course of the day moving on to the standing condition it's very similar to the sitting condition except individuals are asked to break their sentry time by standing close to their chair for five minutes and this occurs after 15 or 45 minutes following each hour after breakfast again the same protocol is repeated after lunch so in total individuals actually accumulate 12 bouts of standing throughout the test period which equals 60 minutes and as you can see the standing occurs after most um, blood pressure and blood tests that we take again the walking is very similar i won't bore you with that it's similar to the, the standing except instead of standing still they'll, they'll jump on a treadmill and walk at four kilometers an hour um, in a nutshell ladies and gentlemen that's more or less it so first of all i'd like to thank you for for staying awake in terms of future studies that we've got probably the best place is to look at the biomedical research unit website that lists not only more details about my studies but everything else that's coming up around centre behaviour and also the the other research that we do in terms of ed, um, structured education um, pharmaceutical trials etc etc um, more widely we also have the Leicester Diabetes Centre website which has a whole host of information about what we do as a group so it just remains for me to say again Thank you very much and I'm more than welcome to take any questions. Thank you.